Dance music, R&B, hip hop, pop, I still can't just reggae, EDM, indie, old school, side, side. <laughs> check it, and sports talk, right here, WorldStarHitRadio.com. Peace, peace, peace. This is Professor Griff here on Serious Minds, right here at World Star Hit Radio. All right, we're trying to log on to hear this and see this live. Go to www.worldstarhitradio.com. It's www.worldstarhitradio.com. We would take callers tonight, but we have a special guest coming on, so we have to kill the phone um, after this, this guest call in. But anyway, jot the phone number down. You can call me next week. 404-751-5062. All right. Shout out to all of the good people here at World Star Hit Radio. And, of course, I'm joined today by my man, Solo from Lion Imagery. You've been hearing me shout him out since the beginning of my uh, my show here. And, of course, I'm joined over here by Miss Soleil. <laughs> Miss Soleil. <laughs> all right. So, yeah. So, um. Of course, we had a guest, a uh, speech from Arrested Development, as I let y'all know. He couldn't make it tonight. Um, what's that company, man, that's making them people sign them 360 deals? Live Nation. Live Nation called him up, so he had to do a gig. <laughs> and uh, so shout out to Speech and everyone that's participating in his band, Arrested Development. Some of y'all need to check out his music, all right? But, um, of course, this is brought to you by Black History 101 Mobile Museum with my man Khalid El Akim and um, Exotic Mixtures with Exotic Naturals with Kiki um, Shaw. Check both of them out on on um, on IG. All right. Um, and of course, my man Solo from Lion Lion Imagery. All right. Shout out to everyone here. That's my audience right here. Facebook. Um, I might not be paying too much attention to y'all because one of my producers told me I need to look up more. You understand what I'm saying? And, talk to the audience this might need to be here yeah so anyway but anyway um i'm glad y'all on i can barely see anyway without my glasses but anyway tonight we have a special show i'm sure some of the people that's sitting in front of me did not know that tomorrow is the 30th anniversary of public enemies album it takes a nation of millions to hold us back 30 years that's 30 years man y'all not understand what i'm saying I started to do this show with this hat on. 30 damn years. Yeah. It don't even fit no more. 30 damn years, man. Damn, it still fit. No, all I got to do is get up and just hit a couple. Of 30 damn years. I've been wearing this damn hat. 30 damn years, for real. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. So I'm sure some of y'all remember those songs, right? Um... I need y'all to hit us up, um, at least hit me up on here on Facebook Live and let me know how them songs moved y'all when y'all first heard them. Brothers be telling me straight up, man, I heard y'all when I was in prison. You understand what I'm saying? I got out of prison. I'm like, damn, I need to get my damn, I get my life together. You understand what I'm saying? Them brothers was putting it down. Them brothers got me through college. Them brothers got me through some serious times. Them brothers was um, that vehicle to help me get knowledge yourself. Damn. I gotta take this thing off. This is like bringing back some memories. It's just tighter than a mud doohickey for real. But anyway, um, so yeah, 30 years, Carolyn Grady, what's up? Um, 30 years of public enemy. Let me see. I think, I think, I think we had 17, 18 projects since then. Don't ask me to name them. Bum, I can only remember three. Bum rush the show. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back in fear of a black planet. <laughs> After that is a blur. Because um, as y'all remember, I got the boot. You understand what I'm saying? No, don't get me wrong. I do know the albums. But um, it's one of those kind of situations where that album set the tone for Public Enemy. And I think when you go back to uh, look back on Public Enemy's career, I think a lot of people go back to that album. Most of y'all don't even remember the first album. Any one of y'all, name me one song off the first album. Nope, no one. Thank you. Name one song off our first album, Public Enemy's first album. Yeah, all right. <laughs> she said, 
<laughs> All right, so yeah, that first album got by a lot of people, but um, it landed us on a tour with the Beastie Boys, which was one of our first tours. And um, it was critical, man. Coming from Roosevelt, Long Island, um, Roosevelt, Long Island is one square mile. The last white family, because back then it was white flight, when black people start moving in, white people start moving out. So the last family to move out of um, Roosevelt, Long Island was Howard Stern's family. You know Howard Stern, who has a talk show. Uh, after that, a few other white people, stragglers, stayed in Long Island, Roosevelt, Long Island. And uh, Ro Long Island was, I mean, Roosevelt was black after that. So, and that energy vortex right there, I think I was telling you, John, um, Dr. J, Julius Irving, Two of the members of Guy, Damien and Aaron, Eddie Murphy and Charlie Murphy. Y'all may not old, be old enough to remember John Mackey, who played for the Colts. Public Enemy. Who else? I'm missing some people. But just in that small little area, all of these people are from that's this area. All right? Right across the bridge over in the Uniondale. You got Buster Rhymes and Ella Ness, leaders of the new school. Um, down the road, De La Soul. Down the road, Eric B and Rakim. Right down the road, uh, EPMD. Um, I know I'm missing some people. Uh, but anyway, it was an energy vortex, all right, there on, on, on Long Island. It was 119 miles long. And, um, yeah, it was... It was one of those critical kind of things. Now I don't, I don't mind. We got a studio audience, <laughs> so I'm good. But um, so yeah, it's just one of those kind of situations. So I'm gonna hit my man KG up, and he's gonna give us a call at 404-751-5062. Um, what are those some of those songs y'all remember, man? Remember any of the songs off Public Enemy's album? Come on, man. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> you got jokes, man. <laughs> no, that I'm past the first one. I'm on the second one now. Yeah, the second album, the, uh, the most popular album was our second album. So I'm, let me call KG. Oh, that might be KG right there. KG. Yo. Peace. What's up, man? What up, peace? How you feel? You all right? All right, can y'all pick him up? Well, you want me to put the microphone over there? Are you straight? All right, so KG, welcome to World Star Hit Radio, man. This is my show, Serious Minds. All right, and this is my first time ever interviewing you. Is that right? <laughs> right, that's Yo, right. We got a lot to talk my about, mind, man. So, and my, mind, and my mind don't be too serious half the time. <laughs> we already know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, just just like I told you, man, just be yourself, bro. There's a lot of questions okay. that that we we I want to be able to fill in the blanks for the people that's just catching up and rem those that's remembering Public Enemy, that experienced Public Enemy, that heard our songs, but those people that that's just catching on who Public Enemy is, we're gonna fill in the blanks for them. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. All right, on the that's phone cool. line, I have the wizard. KG from the Bomb Squad. He's not allowed to say it, but I can say it. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're gonna talk. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that. My brother, my brother from another mother. Right? No, from the same mother. <laughs> so those those that are in Public Enemy might be watching and listening. Maybe they can call in and help fill in the blanks. But yeah, this is a conversation between Professor Grip and the Wizard KG of the Bomb Squad of Public Enemy. Now, let's start off from the beginning, man, so people can get the history right. Prior to Public Enemy, what was going on? What, what, what were we doing prior to Public Enemy? Well, we was, uh, we, we first, first of all, we were playing on the same Little League football team. <laughs> the same Little League football team. You was a scrub. Yeah, I sat on the bench anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> we was on the same Little League football team. All right. The midget, right. <laughs> so so we, we came up in our, our youth center, man. Roosevelt Youth Center. Right. 
Uh, I can say, I, I mean, come on, man. We, we, me and you, we, 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 we grew up together. We lived around the corner from each other. Right. So we had the, the Jefferson Jets and the Madison Saints. Oh man, you don't <laughs> know nothing about that. You know when you make up, make up names for your football team. There's only about three head, people right? on each team, so yeah. All right. All right. So you know, it, 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 I, I can say, I guess our music career. Shockley, these are the early days of Public Enemy, um, yeah. Rose, Roosevelt Youth Center on Mansfield Avenue in Roosevelt. It's still there, right? The little one is, but the big one is still there. Okay, cool. Which is owned by, you know, which is owned by uh, Reverend Arthur Mackey. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so that's it. And then, you know, they kind of, you know, they, they block the street all. They put uh, a shopping mall over there. So yeah. There's a one-way now, but back then, two-way street. Um, and, and from there... Um, you know, uh, Mr. Jones, you know, was, was one of the, one of the, uh, head guys right. at the youth center. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the, one of the other guys is Mr. John Williams. Uh, so, who, uh, like, with, well, as a matter of fact, we no, K KG, like KG. Fast forward this shit, man. <laughs> Fast forward it, man. Fast forward it to Spectrum City. Gypsy man, right, right. Had, had all the rounds, right? Right. Now, hold on. Give the people a time frame. When did, when, what was hip hop doing at this time now? Centennial Park in 1976 with the blackout. Uh, King Charles. <laughs> you don't even understand that. When there was a blackout in New York, people went crazy. You talking about you had a little system at one one time. After the blackout, you had speakers and all kind of stuff. <laughs> it was a blackout. So if it was a blackout, no alarm systems on on stores or nothing. <laughs> how many how many how many speakers how many speakers did King Charles bring to Centennial Park? Charlie would bring maybe like uh ten, maybe like 
10 uh, B48 reflex. And, 10. Uh, he had uh, uh, a rack of amps. He had the, the rack of amps. The, remember the, the Macintosh amp with Ridiculous. The people to carry? Right, right, right. And um, they had um, um, the ring radiators that uh, kind of like what we call them bullets, but it was like kind of like ring radiators, and, they, and they, most of them came out of the traffic signals. Oh man, that's crazy. Traffic signals in the streets. Right, they were stealing everything. If it wasn't nailed down, it was stolen. (laughs) Trust me, they didn't have no tracking devices or nothing like that. So it was just gone. So uh, let's fast forward. Now, after the blackout, people got their weight up. When did the Spectrum City actually think this thing actually kicked in? And who were the members? Okay, the Spectrum City came about. Well, let me give a little background while we all had the youth center doing stuff. And remember when I told you we was doing those parties? Right. At one point, Eugene and Hank had to figure out they needed to come up with a name because we was getting all these books and we had no name. It was, and I was a little dude, so I wasn't hanging out with them. So yeah. I was doing a little spinning, but not that much. Right. So they had to figure that out. Right. And then once we got came up with the name Spectrum, then all of a sudden, the youth center started to shift. The new center came in. The right. The new building came in. And then all of a sudden, we kind of moved. The, the equipment that, that we was using at the youth center into my mom's basement. Yeah, I remember your mom's and basement. And then, and then we were still doing parties. You know, still doing parties out of my mom's basement because the whole new, the new youth center kind of changed this whole format. Right. They thing wasn't going down no more. Um, the, the little radio station that we had, w, uh, WRYC, right. that, that wasn't going down no more. So from then, when it moved to my mom's basement, then that kicked in. When he, when he, when he says mom's basement, that was Miss Dorothy Boxley on Madison Avenue in, in Roosevelt. All right, Gabe, we're following you. He's taking a long way around, but okay. Yeah, I took a long way around. I got you. Now, this is pre-public enemy. So we yeah. got Hank Shockley, Keith Shockley, myself. Um, I remember Bubby. Um, there was a couple other people. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, so we, we was doing that. Um, and then we was doing all of the uh, 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 all the local parties. Right. School, right. Um, uh, block parties. Right. Um, weddings. Bar mitzvahs, yeah, divorces, Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yep, the basement parties, we did the Sportsman 30, yo, we was like, (laughs) the Sportsman 30. So, for that crazy, right, we was getting it in locally from between Roosevelt, Uniondale, Hempstead, Lakeview, um, Rockville Center, Freeport, right. we had that little trash that we, we call it our quad state area right. in, in Nassau County. Right. So let me ask you and, something. What was the transition between Spectrum City into Public Enemy? So that, tra- that transition came about through the BAU years. Right. So from then, you know, and then things shifted on, we shifted into the BAU years. So from the BAU years, that's when, you know, Chuckhead, Chuckhead came just before that. Like the end of, I'm going to say like 79. Right. Okay, got down with us. From now, wait a minute. Now, now, so, now, at that point, I had already graduated high school. You had graduated high school? I already graduated high school. So now we're talking two or three, it was two or three years before that, before Chuck even came on the scene. Chuck, was, well, Chuck wasn't even there on the scene. Chuck was, a, was just coming to our party. See, people need to understand right. this because they get the history of public enemy twisted, bro. And yeah. they, they need to hear this. So it was years before we even... We, he was there. But go on, we're listening. We're, we're, we're all living in the same town. So Roosevelt is he, one square mile. All right. Yeah, well, one square mile. So we, we're all in the same town. So Chuck was coming. You know, he would come to our party. And I remember, wait a minute. I remember one of the crazy stories, but we never even met Chuck, but he said the first time he wild out when he heard us get down, you had just picked up Dance to the Drummer's Beat. Oh and it was only heard once in New York City and nobody ever didn't hear that sh- didn't hear that shit on nowhere Wait. on Long Island. 
Do you hear what he just said, y'all? Professor Griff went thumbing through the crates, and I found two records. Herman Kelly's Dance to the Drummer's Beat, and it was a rap after that. Have you ever heard Dance to the Drummer's Beat? You talk about the B-Boy Anthem, one of them. It was Dance to the Drummer's Beat by Herman Kelly. Yeah, but go on. Gangsters now, back then we called them stick up kids. Because they used to just rob people. We ain't gonna talk about that, but go ahead. Right. Touch the mic, right. <laughs> right? Right. 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 Mom Albert, right. to the military and came back. That was willing to, willing to put it down, but anyway, we had some extra curricular activity on the side. But but go on. <laughs> yeah. So from that, from then, we you know we started doing um between that we was on BAU. We started doing um I started making beats for the local for the local talent. Right. On BAU, and then everybody was coming through, and we and then from there we kind of became party promoters because of how it was. We wanted to get heard. 
So right. We wanted to get hurt instead of waiting for somebody to hire us. We just threw our own party. Right, exactly. So for the people that's just for the people that's just tuning in, I'm on the phone with K Wizard KG from um from the Bomb Squad, the producers of Public Enemy. Um, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. This is the 30th anniversary. Tomorrow's the 30th anniversary of the album. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. We're gonna go over some of those songs in a minute. All right, so we're following you. Come on. So, so from then, um, then we uh, we went on. I forgot to tell you. Remember, my mom kicked us out of the, out of the crib because she didn't. She didn't want we was running up on light though. We had to get out of the crib. <laughs> and when we was there, he was like, she came in like, she was like, I want, I want this shit out of the house. Y'all so running up my light though. I got a nine hundred dollar light though. She was burning up. So we found our spot in Right. That's the set. That, that stage. What do you want to call that? Stage three. Yeah, stage three. Yeah. A stage. It's a four part stage. You set up mom's crib. That's that. Right. Suffolk County. to the early days of Public Enemy now. Now, there's nine stories that 
stories of who brought it to Def Jam. I can say Dre, Dr. Dre from your MTV Rap, Dr. Yep. Dr. Dre. Yep. But at that time, Dre was, uh, uh, Rick had stepped off from the Beastie Boys. Dre was with us at, at BAU, but he started DJing for the Beastie Boys. Right. The only Beastie Boys before Eric came. came right. So this was before our deal. We had no deal. And running them was coming in. So the other part is, hey, Dan Master J heard it. Red screaming at Leon and Russell about the shit that Chuck did. Mm. And, 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 you, and DMC was like, oh my God, this dude's voice sounded like the voice of God. Now, we didn't know them. They just used to come out and hang out and we right. used to right. our radio station. Right. So, when they heard that demo of Public Enemy, mm -hmm. which, came, which was the first single, number one, that's when Ricky and them said, they got to have Chuck. Right. And they only wanted Chuck. Right. Now, right. How, now how did Flavor... How, okay, they only wanted Chuck. They only wanted to sign Chuck to a deal with Def Jam. Yeah. What happened after that? Yeah. So, what happened was... It's, it's a lot of stuff that happened into that. They just wanted MC Chucky D. Y'all didn't hear that. No, wait, wait, wait. The people sitting in front of me didn't hear that. MC Chucky D. Okay. I'm like, bruh. Chucky D. No. <laughs> not going to get signed as MC hey. Chucky D, bro. <laughs> MC Chucky D. So, that was his MC that we was getting down. He's Chucky D on the microphone. Young lady is going to bring you home. And that kind of rock. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, now, Flavor was just hanging around the block because we was we had a, we had another rap crew <laughs> that was coming up to the, to the station from Freeport and Flavor's from Freeport. So he just started hanging around, started hanging around. It right. kind of made himself known right. on BAU. Cause then, because then he started the Flavortrons, right? Yeah, he started the Flavortrons. Right. The and, Flavor Flavor and the Flavortrons. And, yes. Yes. Flavor Flavor the Flavortrons. Okay. That was his, that was his, his crew of, I don't know what they was doing. <laughs> right. That was, his, that, was, that was his fan thing. He had a fan thing. Now, here's the crazy thing, right? Flavor had a fan thing back then. Right. It had no more records out of nothing. He just would come on the radio, say a couple of wild stuff, like he does now. Right. And he built his own little audience. Yeah. Now, when he became, when he got his, when he became, the, I'm going to be straight, when he became the local superstar, he had, he had recorded this gospel choir on his box. And while he, while the gospel choir was doing, he was doing a real show. Uh, but it was rehearsing. And while they was rehearsing, he was emceeing in between it right. and recorded it. And it sounded like a like a demo tape. We kept playing that on the radio. Everybody loved it. And then he started to become a star for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I heard I heard, I heard a flavor at that time. I didn't know what the hell he, he did. I know he had no records out or no songs out, but I heard this dude named Flavor who literally lived around the corner from me. And I'm like, well, what does he do? He's like, we don't know, but he's, he's popular. He, 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 he was just popular. Everybody knew him from Freeport. Everybody knew him. So from then, decided to give him his own show. Right. From DAU. Right. Play the play show. Just stupid things he would do in the streets and record it and talk and play the music he liked. Right. The music, and the music he wrote, he wrote some music. Now you gotta understand that that's how Blake was doing He had wrote some songs. He was probably, he was the first one that we had around him uh, that really wrote songs all by himself. He hated them. <laughs> <laughs> but he was probably, Flavor was probably the and most talented out of all of us. He was the most talented. Right. Besides, besides my cousin Eric that had the band downstairs. Right, right. Right, right, okay, right. Eric comes, Eric comes in late. Uh, right. He was the most talented that hung out with us constantly at the gigs and at BAU. Right, okay. He knew how to play the piano and everything. Right. So he got his own show. And you understand, that, that's, what, like 83? 83? Yeah. When you have a radio show in the New York tri-state area, which, which, which included, well, we included... Uh, Long Island, Nassau County, yo man, it was like the shit. 
Exactly. It was, it was like, yo, man, you, that was, he was like sway in the morning. Right, so let me so let me bring the people up to speed. This is K, Wizard KG from the Bomb Squad. All right, um, we're going to get to the public enemy thing right now. But um, hopefully y'all are understanding this particular brief history of uh, the history that led up to us becoming public enemy. You have Flavor on one hand doing this thing. Um, really popular, talented musician playing four and five, six, seven, eight different instruments. Popular, more popular than any one of us. I think I was popular, more popular in a different kind of way as far as the martial arts and that kind of thing. Chuck because of his uh, voice and then being on WBAU. Hank Shockley. And we have on the phone his brother Keith Shockley. Um, because... Eric was doing his own thing. Eric Vietnam Sadler was doing his own thing at the time. Dre, because I remember shortly after that, we formed the unit. And it was me, Dre, you, Hank, Chuck. And we were doing uh, parties at the um, Korean Ballroom. At the Korean Ballroom. Remember, Dre was started the original concept. Original concept, right. They got, they got signed before we did. Right. Dre was... Was the Beastie Boys DJ? Right. So they put out Street for the Face of the Cool Eye, which was about them in, in living in Westbury. Right, right, but right. They came out with that. They came out with their their album first. Right. But we, we were, and we wasn't even signed. We were signed. So from then, when they heard the song that we did, uh, the, the the demo that we had put together, we right. played on BAU Public Enemy Number One. Between, and like I said, I've been between Dre, whoever, I've been so many stories, Dre, either Jay, or one of the Beastie Cats. <laughs> I think it was, I think it might have been the Admiral. Yeah, right, right. They, they, was, they was screaming about Chuck's vocals on that song, and DMC was beating them in the head, even though it was over inside that profile. Right. So what happened, what happened was, we wanted to sign just Chuck E.D. Mm -hmm. So, Chuck didn't want to do that because, the, and Hank didn't want to do that because what what the goal was was to be party promoters like the way Russell started. Right. Because Russell was the big party party promoting king mm -hmm. of, of, of that time. He started right. all the parties and right. he was, started to manage the artists. They wanted to do that. Wanted to do that. Right. It, it, it wasn't panning out. Right. So, Chuck called it the Great Surrender. So after a year of, a year, now listen, a year of Rick Rubin bugging the hell out of Chuck. Right. Decide, Chuck finally decides to decide. Now nobody gets that, now. nobody has got that. I've never seen a record lady even to spend a year on waiting to sign an artist. Right, and I remember at that, I remember at that time that he brought flavor with him, and I think the deal yeah, was because, because the deal was the problem was you had a bunch of solo artists, right, and you had a bunch of D's running around. Remember, we had a bunch of a bunch of artists with the with the name D at the end, right? Because right. we always wanted to be different. Remember, you, we had Spider D, Spider D, D, Schooly D, yeah, yeah, Cool Mo D, Heavy D, <laughs> Heavy D. Cool. <laughs> you had you had um 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 uh uh um uh, what what else um Donald D you had all these Damn. D's man um everybody and and, and these are, these were New York City Queens Brooklyn and C and they kind of popular they not you know we right. killing the the tri-state area and and when and when the first of hip hop coming from the Bronx kid. Now, like I said, it's, it's changing now. We, now the new cats are coming up. Right, right, right. Now, now it's, it's like, well, wait a minute. We always was about groups because we felt that groups can beat a single person all day long. Right. <laughs> so the thing was, was like, how are we going to be different in everybody than Chucky e. D? What is Chucky e. D? Right. Great vocalist, but... My hate was always in the concert. Always in hate and Chuck was always in the concert. Chuck was in the concert because he was in the comic book and, and, his, right. and his art and his drawing. Chuck was a phenomenal uh, artist. Right. So just just so people just so people know, it was Chuck D that came up with this logo, the Public Enemy logo, uh, yeah. in in uh, at Adelphi yeah. University. 
for graphic design, right? Yeah, for graphic design. Yep. Back I'll then, the shut the joys behind off, man. man. I mean, if he wasn't, yeah. if he wasn't in public enemy, he'd probably be an artist somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Probably be a radio announcer or something because the magnitude of his voice and the man was phenomenal yeah. artist. But go on. know something at this point. Now at this point, with that, that's a good point you made because Chuck gave us all of our names. Uh, Terminator X, Professor yep. Griff, Buster yep. Rhymes, yep. Um, uh, um, Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown from Leaders of the yep. New School. Tell that story that Chuck gave him his name. He tells that story all the time. I got a video oh. table bus. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. All right, let's fast let's let's fast forward. Assassin. birth to the whole idea of the bomb squad, you know, four and five people producing. thing as opposed to just a rap group but listen there are pe there are people there are people holding they want to know about these that that album it takes a nation of means to hold us back because we're 44 minutes in and we still haven't got to it <laughs> Right. So we can get our point across mm -hmm. to the to the 
that time, at that time, we didn't uh, our uh, what you call it? Our um, uh, the first album, Your Brother Was the Show, was released was released late, and it was dated to us. So right. In order, but you gotta hear the story before our tape nation come back. In order for the ball, remember. We on the all we on the road doing on the road doing um uh the the, the you know the first album your brother was the show album right now I set it off the things how the, the concept was set up um uh, the things set up was you was on tour and um Rock Jim and them and came out and just dropped um uh, I know you got soul right it was like the summer was it summer of eighty Nah, 80, no, 80, 80, 87. 87, right. 87, 87. 87. Right. Now, we, we was releasing the next single off the Yo Brothers the show album. Right. Wait, so tell the them, they don't, they, don't, they don't even know what the first one was. What was the first one? You're going to get yours. You're going to get, no, that, that was the next single. The first one, remember the first one was, um, um, what you call it? Um, um, Public uh, Called giving me number one, the right? Second single, the, the next single was "You're Going to Get You." Right. It's my Uzi ways a ton. Right. It was we felt those those two songs was old and dated because those albums were worked on in '85 right, and right. '87. Right. Right. Those songs were '85 and '87. We needed something that was was hot and banging and current and, and current, and, right? And current. So by that time. When I rock Kim dropped, I know you got soul. We was losing our minds, like yo. Yeah. Eric, this is Eric. That's where Eric is the fucking genius. <clears throat> he goes in and has and comes up with this track, just a basic track. Now, that's um um rebel without a pause. Right. You understand? We with our hands spinning, we don't make track like that. We make a basic track. Eric had the basic track that was fake. Chuck wrote that on Melvin. He wrote that on the we sent it to y'all while y'all was on the road. I don't right. know y'all was that. Right. We sent it to y'all on the road. Mm -hmm. Chuck wrote Rebel Wild Pause being on the road. Say, yo, I got it. So now he's kind of stalled on releasing the uh the um, my Uzi my Uzi ways a ton. Right. You're going to get your CD. Right. And because the um, album, because if you're going to get your was the main title, Rebel Without a Pause became an unreleased beat. Right. It wasn't released. We didn't, and we didn't have, we wasn't even thinking about Takes the Nation. It, we just needed a hot ass single. So, and we had a couple of dollars left over in the budget from Def Jam to record. Wait a minute. So like, well, Hold up. Stop. How much Def Jam gave us to make this album, man? Oh, what? Like, I think like nine grand all in. I think all in was $14,000. That's it. Maybe $14,000. Yeah, I think $14,000. That's it. $14,000 to make a whole album. Can't be spending that shit on one song now. We have to make when the whole say, album. When we, say, when we say all in, that means album, artwork, all that shit. That's it. That's it. That's all you got. We had a couple of dollars left over because the artwork was basically, just, you know, Chuck was trying to take do with the artwork, so we didn't have to do much. And he knew what he wanted. Right. So I was just lucky. So when we record, that's why on the 12 inch single, uh, Rebel Without a Pause is like the almost the, the B side and the second and the second song. Right. The side, because that wasn't supposed to be. But. After we did that, recorded it, brought it down, we, y'all was on the road, we had a couple of seconds. We, after we finished the master, we had just got the, the new presents from Def Jam. Right. We hated each other, went up to, uh, Chuck Chill Out. We, we dropped that, we dropped it to Chuck Chill Out, because we had to bang the kid at the radio station, the BLS. Uh, yo, man, just make sure you give it to Chuck, because they, they wouldn't let us up. So right. we didn't know that he was going to get it. The minute we walked back from the from dropping the song off to the security guard, I, I don't know what the security guard is, but I, I would love to thank him. We dropped it to the security guard. The security guard took it up to Chuck. Right. 
Chuck heard Chuck chill out, heard that shit. And by the time we got into the car, turned the car on, he he didn't even get approved of it for nobody. He played that song for twenty minutes. Yeah, I remember those days. And almost got fired for play for play records right that long. Right. He almost got fired. That gave that in turn fueled the concept for it takes a nation. Right, right, right. That single moment and that production where now it's just this gonna take the nation of millions to hold us back. <laughs> we ain't going no damn way. Right. So let me let me say this at this point. So at this particular point now, um out of my whole crew of Unity Force and plus some other cats I was associated with, we first went out on a roll with Ben Ransom and Dwayne Kuzon. The first two S1Ws. Those are the first two I took out on the road with me. Um, right after that, it was James Norman um, and it was James Allen. I and um, and then later on, Roger Chillis was my best friend at that time, and and then Mike became Mike became an S1W, and a lot of these brothers was cast. I was pulling from my martial arts class and study group, so everyone knew martial arts. And then I thought I, th I think I brought Drew on to do sound lights and some other stuff, but um, everybody knew martial arts. All of us was karate kung fu heads. You understand what I'm saying? Because as Keith just finished saying, yo, man, the streets was crazy, man. And we needed somebody to protect the parties. So I put the crew together. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, but go on, man. I'm just filling in some of the gaps. Yo, man, and, 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 and shoot, man, I remember y'all doing them tournaments at Madison Square Garden. Coming right. back with trophies. Right. Come on, man. <laughs> and I know that part. This right. Was, this was real. For Cassie to be like, y'all ain't know we was real with. Right. So, from that, that became the production of the Takes a Nation album. And and, and what, what else is this thing? The greatest street record ever. And here was another thing that we did with the Takes a Nation. Remember, Griff, when y'all was over in London, mm -hmm. we had to convince, this was, this was how we had to convince the United States that rap, all, all the people in the corporations that rap was here to stay. Right. That's why the inserts from the album, which was, we were the first one to ever do that, too, right. was taken from your shows that y'all was doing in London with the, with the, with the Odeon. Right. Uh, ha ha Hammersmith Odeon, uh-huh. Hammersmith Odeon. Right. That was to show America that rap music has transformed from the states to across the world. Right, 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 right. Because nobody has heard, nobody knew what was happening outside of the, outside of the state. Right. We in our own bubble. Right. Hold we put put a, those excerpts from London. All right, hold on, now, hold on, hold on one second, KG. For the people that's just tuning yeah. in, this is Professor Grip on Serious Minds right here at World Star Hit Radio. If you want to listen to this okay. live, go to www.worldstarhit.com. Radio. You can't call in because we have Wizard KG on the line giving us the history of, of the this 30 years of It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, one of Public Enemy's probably most monumental albums. And according to Rolling Stone, Billboard, and a few other top magazines, says the best hip-hop rap album ever made. 30 Years Tomorrow. It was released June 28th, 30 years ago. All right, and I still got the damn hat. This is critical, man. But go ahead. I'm wearing my red beret, bro. But go ahead. <laughs> so, at that time, the, 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 the battle of, of hip-hop music and the, and the record label still hasn't transformed. Right. You know, running up, did they say? Yep. It, 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 it was only mainly relegated to the state. Right. They didn't believe promoting it overseas until we put those inserts of how crazy it was you know, the Hammerson audience in London. Now, wait a minute. And they were everybody. Now, Keith, you remember when Chuck yeah. Chillout was playing Public Enemy to Death, there was another DJ, and I think I could mention his name, Molly Maul, who played our song once, scratched it, yeah. took it off the damn Tory table, sound like he broke oh, it and yeah. threw it away, no, and said no more music from the more, suckers. That, that was Mr. Magic, but Mr. Magic and Molly was together, but Mr. Magic got, got, got uh, Chuck Thought we was whack. Thought we was whack. 
just whack. And he said it on the air, no more music from the suckers. Called the yeah, called the suckers. No more music by suckers. He took it off, and that was the uh, public enemy number one album. Right. He took it off the air, broke it on the air, and kind of like just us in the hat. Mm. No more music by the suckers. Then we came back. We came back with a vengeance at the Latin quarters and just ripped it. <laughs> I, I, I ripped it, and that's why we took that insert and put it on the middle, put it on the beginning of flavors. Cold lapping, right? Flavor, flavor, cold oh, lapping. Cold lapping, right? That was we was going after everybody that had something against us, and that's why the production in there was monumental. Hank made sure that it had to be the dirtiest, scratchiest, hardcore banging that made you want to fight. <laughs> Right, Chuck. I think Chuck said. Chuck said at that time he wanted to make music that uh, women women couldn't dance to. Yep. He didn't want nobody dancing. He want everybody listening. <laughs> to the media this takes a nation of millions man shout out to eric sadler shout out to bill stephanie shout out to all of the s1w's mike james pop um Dwayne, ben roger uh crunch i could go on and on on uh, queen Asia, uh simone um angie they didn't know we had female s1w's but go ahead man go on yeah. we're listening yeah. was the main thing because all the samples, the edits, the dropouts and all this kind of stuff, post production was 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 critical. Let's go through the songs and you you just tell us. When the album first comes up, come on, what do you hear? Um, go get a lay pad. <laughs> 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 Now I, I, base, I said Armageddon's, Armageddon's been in effect. Go get a late pass. <laughs> Armageddon's been in effect. Go get a late pass. And I said this time around, the revolution will be not be televised. Right. 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 Some of the records that he knew. Me and Hank understood sample parts, and so did Chuck, because we had a record lock 
library. You know, we had a regular library that was in, in 84 that was, in, that was crazy. Oh, my God. Thousands of records we had, man. Yo, and, that, and, and Mark, I see cats with record collections today. I be telling you, I'm super bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> and we had that in 84. And it wasn't too many records out like you got now. Right. I think the I last think the last time I counted, uh, ter- welcome to the Terror Dome with twenty samples, man. Yo, man, Night of the Basehead had about maybe two hundred samples. I mean, it was ridiculous. So Nine when Night of the Basehead, I would be straight. Out of all the joints, we did a lot of stuff, but as far as the a, 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 a art form and the sample form, mm. Night of the Basehead was the best. Yeah, I, I, w- I would say that. But, you know, my favorite my favorite song was Prophets of Rage. Prophets of Rage because we took them Jackson 5. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, Jackson 5 and Earth, Wind, and Fire. And Earth, Wind, and Fire, yeah. Right. All right, so let me run these songs down. Don't Believe the Hype, man. What do you, what do you remember about that song? Didn't you do yeah, something backwards in there? I kind of, I kind of, I kind of was messing with David D's old one for the trouble. I was chopping it up. Right. The S nine fifty. Right. And and, and then also I kind of looped it, and it kind of looped in an awkward way, and it kind of made it felt like you were stuck in the stuck in the mud when you heard it. Right. But then we go on top of it and put another drum program, and then Don't Believe the Hype just came out, found this, who found the squeal, um, through chucked out the squeal, and that was. And we would cut them shits on turntables and then realize that's it. We record the record the wild scratching on turntables, record it in the nine fifty, then play it back. And play it back. Eight. Right, so right, we're right. On point. Right, right. But right. we're on point. Um okay, so what's up with um Cole Lampin with Flavor? Oh, okay. I, I, was, I wasn't even in the studio that day. I'll, yeah, Cole I wasn't was, I was yeah. yeah. I wasn't in the studio that day. I don't know where I was. Um Hank just came back and said, Yo, where did I just join Cole Cole Lappin? And Eric, once again, then on that album, Eric was the main master programmer. Right, right. He was the master programmer. He programmed the shit out of all of that. Uh, in case y'all exactly. wondering who we're talking about, we're talking about Eric Vietnam Sadler. When you look at Public yeah. Enemy songs, you'll see his name. This dude was a musician, yeah. and this dude was bad. I mean, yeah. I mean, the yeah. technology was advancing, drum machines and... This, I seen him do some stuff with the S950 that was ridiculous, man. I was just scratching my head. I said, okay, you got it, bro. Eric, Eric taught me all the technology side, the early technology side of the machines coming out. Because he knew how to work it. And he I said, yo, how do you do that? He had to show me a lot of I knew the basic drum machine. Right. When we started getting the sequences and, and other types of sampling and time right. signatures and stuff like that. He kind of taught me all that. The different different styles of times. Right. I right. knew it because we took music in high school, but he came in, so he was our main dude. He would come with the basics, and he was our main technician because he's worked in, he, he had more studio tech from the musician side than we did. Right. What's up with Terminator so X to the Edge of Panic, man? Terminator X to the Edge of Panic. That was all Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Terminator, Terminator X. <laughs> Shout out. And, 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 oh. And, oh, wait. Terminator. Remember on, um, 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 Bring the Lord, um, uh, 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 rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? Yeah. The rock and roll. The Transformer scratch. Roll. Okay. The Transformer. Let's go back. I gotta go back to that story. So, he came in and he did that. He did that. He came in with the Transformer and the rock and roll. We was like, uh, yeah, it's all right. We didn't think about it. I think we was kind 
know, music out for a minute. Yeah. We came back to the studio a day later. Our ears got adjusted. And we said, yo, put up, uh, put up, bring the noise. They put up, bring the noise. We had it. And then we listened to his shit again. We fucking ran around the Ran, we, we ran around the studio, damn near fighting each other, realizing how dope those cuts and scratches right. were. And we didn't hear nothing like that shit. Right. And, and that was weird. We didn't like it at first. But we came back and that thing like, this shit is incredible. Right. Lost it in the studio. Shout out to, uh, like shout out to Melo, Melo D. <laughs> that was Terminator X. DJ Melo, Melo D. D. song that he scratched? It was rock and roll, but I can't remember if it was... You remember what band? I don't remember what band. Okay. Alright, so we got Mind Terror. We got Mind Terrorist. We got to get him on and find out. I don't remember what band that was. That was, but it was crazy. And we were like rock and roll. We were like, uh, we were like, oh, nah. We, we, we were on the fire at when he first did it. <laughs> All right, what's up? What's up with my, what's up with mind terrorists? Mind terrorists was was an instrumental, yeah, um, instrumental beat that Eric created, and we just was we was experiment with so much shit. It wasn't like nothing, you know, you know, you know, it shit wasn't planned. We were just playing around with shit. Well, I, I took it, I took it, and I took it and and used that in the show so the S1Ws can display what we do as far as martial arts and. Drilling and all that kind of stuff because during those days, my introduction to the Nation of Islam was critical, and all of them samples that you hear inside uh, it takes a nation of millions. That's the kind of that's the stuff I was feeding Chuck like check this out, man. Check this sister out, Ava Muhammad. Check this brother out. You understand what I'm saying? And that was critical, man. That was, that was critical, but that was your job. We ain't know that. I'm, I didn't know that. I'm like, yo, you go ahead and do that. And, and what's Critical with those instrumentals and what you put together for the stage show. Oh, thank like, you. It just, it just fell in the place. Right, 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 right. It was like we, we were so much on a click that we knew because you gotta understand we all grew up together. Right. So we knew everything from DJing with each other to music and how things should be presented. To getting kicked out, to getting kicked out of your mom's right. house. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, that's the stuff I was. I, that's the stuff I live by. So it was like, yo, Chuck, this is what we should do. Here you go. Check this out. Yeah. That's is a, that's that that's what it was. That just took everybody to the next plane. Right. Come on, man. Freedom is a road. So Seldom travel by the multitude. By the multitude. That's right. <laughs> Right, that's another thing. Let's let the people know before we get off here. How many groups that Public Enemy influenced? Everybody. Come on, man. No. No, name some names, bro. Name some names. I'm, I'm, yo, yo, I'm going to be straight. I'm dead serious. I don't get into this like that. We influenced everybody. That was, except for Marley. I'm a Marley as a producer. We didn't influence Marley. He, we, we were snatching what he was doing because he was first. With sampling and chopping and going crazy. Right, 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 we right. We took it to the next level. I, right. mean, I give Marley all that, Marley Mall, Marley, all that credit. But everybody else that came out of that? Everybody else tried to make a PE record after we did that album. How, how, many people, how, many, how, how many people did we work with after that? I mean, I'm talking about the Bomb Squad. I'm talking about... The bomb, yeah, and we worked with Soul from Slick Rick to LL to the Ice Cube's album and... and um, Vanessa Harry Williams. Um, uh, we, we, uh, oh, man. Um, we, we was turning out people because it got, it got so crazy. How about Bell Biv DeVoe like, or, or New Bell Edition? Bell Bell Bell, we, uh -huh. we, we just Bell Biv DeVoe because they was breaking up from New Edition. They came to us. Um, fix, we fixed Poison for them because Poison, the original version, that's not what that was. That's right. our version. Right. 
but we gave them a blessing on that. But came along with thought it was me, ain't nothing changed, wrote the rhymes for them, um, and, and um, lyrics, everything. Them remixes, we was banging them out. We did a bunch of Ziggy Marley remixes, tumbling it down. We put Vanessa Williams on the map yep. in the dance club. After all that shit she was going through, <laughs> we put her out on the dance club. Right. So, Yo, the story is man. like vast, man. The story is like enough, enough to story make a is, movie. <laughs> the story is vast to make a movie, and the and the story, and as most producers right now, if if you if they've been and heard our stuff and been around, they would tell you that if listen, I was, I was I'll tell you who I should influence the most was for real, because when he did the net tunes, all it was was like. A more musical, trying to be a more musical version of PE. Mm. Because they was noisy when they was doing the Neptune, like when they did what what for uh, for Nori. Right. <laughs> right, right. I remember. <laughs> yeah. What? What? Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. He'll tell you. I influenced from everybody. I influenced influenced Dre after we did his stuff, and then he came back and after he after heard our stuff. The NWA, the, the later NWA product was more like our record. Right. All right. If y'all, if y'all are just tuning, if y'all are just tuning in, I'm on the phone with the Wizard KG from the Bomb Squad. Um, Keith, when did we meet? When I was like ten? Oh, oh. You know, man, you know, I don't know, man. When, when did you move to Roosevelt? You listen back to me. Wait, wait. When did I move to Roosevelt? I've always lived in Roosevelt. I was born and raised in Roosevelt. So, so I was born. Hempstead for five months. Right. 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 We had to go to the same. Well, at one point, remember, at one point, we was we was all going to different schools because we had our area. The zone, uh, right? Uh, the, 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 the you know, all yeah. the roles was, was second and third grade. Right. You were two years older than me, so you was always two years ahead of me. Right. Right. Um, but I, but we know each other from playing little league. With Mr. Simpson and, and and Mr. Jones and all of them, man. Right. And, you know, come on, man. We, right. it, it's like, what, oh. what is that? What is that age? Like five, six. All right. So listen, five, man. Seven. Yeah, let's 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 cap this off. Thirty years later, what's your most fondest memory of the album, making the album? Let me ask you something. If we was to got paid, get paid today for what we did for that album as far as the record sales are concerned, how much money would we have right now? Uh, Steve Jobs money. <laughs> Steve Jobs money. <laughs> it's so over. It was, listen, it was, <laughs> you you, you got to understand. Chuck said one thing. There are the creators, the game changers, and the players. The flash of them was the creators. Mm-hmm. We came in with the game changer. Yeah. Because when we was doing it, it still wasn't. It still it, it was still treated like a fag. The Jay Z is the number the players because now it became valuable. Right. So now they can go on and do the shoe deals and the sneaker deals. Bro. Like now, now they, they those people don't have to fight like the way we had to fight. 
Yo, let me tell you something, man. I'm on the back of a tour bus in Europe. Cold as fuck. You understand? And I hate being cold. <laughs> Chuck said, yo, I got this song, man. It's about this chick um, watching soap operas and all this other kind of stuff. And, and he was presenting to me what would later become She Watched Channel Zero. I've always been this into punk, into metal, that kind of thing. So I think he let me hear a scratch track or something. Uh, me and Chuck rode it on the back of a tour bus in Europe. And um, I said to myself, from that day, from that day forward, um, being, uh, I've always was a writer. You understand what I'm saying? But never, never was asked to lend my talents in, in, in that way as far as the public enemy thing because I was always doing the research. I was always, I don't like to call myself the, a chore choreographer. <laughs> Because it sounds too, yeah, but, you know, I put the show together. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but but you, you, you did it because you understood. That, listen, it, 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 you, who else was going to put the show together? Yeah. That's yeah. one. That's one. But you understood how it worked, man, because you understood it from us as a DJ. Right, 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 right. Because people were saying, you mean to tell me y'all going to come on stage with guns? I'm like, you goddamn right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We would come on stage with Uzis. Then we'd put yeah. them down, break into some martial arts, and then we'd break into some drilling that people never saw before. Because if you never experienced the FOI in the Nation of Islam, no. you never saw that stuff. Because people was used to seeing two dancers. Scoob and Scrap, Kid and Play, and yeah. everybody had dancers. So we like, fuck that. We're going to do this. Right. Right. We 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 had we had because the concept was that. Right. They, they were there to, to put with if it needed to be put in. This is what right. we here to do. Right. So KG, right. I got I got to I got to wrap this up, man. Um, any last words you want to tell the people? What you got going on, man? Um, I got I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm doing some music, <laughs> doing a bunch of things, man. Just trying to work uh, work on a project, but you know we got this documentary. Working on with the Spectre City thing, Spectre City as we came up, right. um, those kind of things. I got some new artists I'm working with, and I'm and I'm doing them in a different way now. Um, I got a single I'm re releasing. Um, I'm going back to our old DJ era, but it's it's kind of it's kind of with where the hipsters are, uh, dance, kind of classics, kind of like. Whoa, 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 whoa! Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. When I asked you. Who do we influence and who do we work with? How come you didn't mention all the times they had the Public Enemy t-shirt in movies or a poster in the movie, just in the Black I, Panther? I forgot about that, man. Yo, it, it, it was like, wait a minute. Story. I was waiting you got a million goddamn stories. Man. Like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, wait a minute. Came back. Um, I was just working on a project with Terminator. Terminator 2 just dropped. Right. Um, Terminator 2 is coming out December 1st. Because they go, Key, let's go to the movie. I think, let's go see Terminator. I go to Terminator, we sitting down. They show that little kid, and he had a public enemy shirt on. I jumped up in the movie theater there. That's my goddamn group! <laughs> like, Yo, you were kind of bugging. <laughs> I lost it. Man. Lost it. Our, our logo is the most recognizable logo on the planet. Probably, probably this and the Playboy Bunny. I don't know about the most popular logo. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying the logo is dope. The Chuck did. Chuck was right here. It's one of the most popular logo. Yeah. 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 I'm about, I got. I got to get this T-shirt up to John because it's too big for me. But go ahead. Yeah. So KG, we got. We got to wrap this up, man. Because I saw. Stuff, man. We can talk about this forever, man. We I saw. Stuff that we, we started. We created. We changed the music game. Right, I saw the poster in the Black Panther movie. I was like, oh, okay. When I first got the um, 
I think I, I, I just woke up out of the bunk. I'm walking down the hallway on the tour bus. And Chuck was like, uh, I got something to tell you. I'm like, what's up? He said, they, I think we're about to get inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was like, nah, fuck out of here. You serious? He was like, nah, I'm serious. So I said, I had to wait for a minute and let it sink in. Then I said, even me? Because <laughs> I knew they wasn't giving me shit. <laughs> he said, yeah, man, you, you wrote, you participated, you did the research, you did X, Y, and Z. He's like, yeah, you. I'm like, all right, cool, man. But anyway, Wizard KG, we got to go, man. One last, one, one last, one last thing. We want to let the people know Spectrum City was the impetus right before Public Enemy to, 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 um, that morphed into Public Enemy. And we had a group called the KGs. And it was the, the KG stood for Keith and Griff. And we were DJs trying to come up producing, trying to come up writing, trying to come up doing what we, doing what we do. And I think right now, if they locked us in a room, I know I could come up with an uh, album's worth of material. How about you? Because right now, because right now, today I have, right now, today I got nine albums out. People don't know that. Look, you even quiet. Look at you. <laughs> yeah, you better, you better go back. You better go back and count, bro. I ain't never stopped writing and producing, man. For real. I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, 2029. No, you got you got one of the most plush studios. My shit is just like homegrown. Yours is like on some uh, B side wins against shit. All right, man, I gotta go. Shout out, shout out to Chuck D, Flavor Flav. Shout out to Terminator X. Shout out to Hank Shockley. Shout out to Mike, Drew, Pop, Roger, Crunch, James, Big James, Small James. Who else am I missing, man? Roger, uh, Roger, I just said Roger, Ben, <laughs> Dwayne. Eric, Eric Ben, no, Shadow. Eric. And then Bill, Bill Stephanie in there. Right, shout out to Rick Rubin. Shout out to that bitch ass, punk ass motherfucker, Russell Simmons. Fuck him. Um, <laughs> shout out to a uh, <laughs> punk ass motherfucker. Um, <laughs> I'm still shouting you out, even though your ass is somewhere out of the country running from them sex allegations. The fucking pervert. Um, fuck Russell. Um, <laughs> we got to end this show, man, before I start going off. <laughs> All right, Keith, really appreciate you, man. We going to hook up. We'll talk. All right, peace. All right. That was KG from the Bomb Squad. Yeah, just scratch that stuff you heard about Russell. Fuck Russell. Anyway, um... <laughs> Uh, what was I about to say? I was about to end it, right? Yeah, this is Professor Griff from Serious Minds. <laughs> Hold on, let me end it like this. <laughs> we got to end this, man. That was my man KG from the Bomb Squad. All right. Um, this is World Star Hit Radio. My name is Professor Griff. And um, this is Serious Minds. You're watching Serious Minds. <laughs> for Serious Minds, as John say. Serious. What do you say? Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> no <Yeah>. shit. <laughs> I, I got to go, man. My hour been up, man. I'll see y'all next week. Peace. Y'all take care. I'm out. Peace. Greetings. This is Professor Griff from Public Enemy. Welcome to the Oculus Inc. The mm. Oculus. They are the ultra-secret society. They are the ones that manipulate and control your perception. They're actually the gatekeepers of your perception. The Oculus are the ones that actually write the prescription. They are the ones to determine who and why you see what you're actually seeing through signs and symbols. These signs and symbols, we see them every single day. Your banks, your fast food stores, Energy companies, gas stations, car companies, sports teams, all of them have signs and symbols that they use in such a way where they speak a language to one another. These are the things that the Oculus controls. The Oculus. Oculus Inc. The hot, the hot, the hot, the hot.
music, R&B, hip hop, pop, I still can't reggae, EDM, indie, old school, side, side. <laughs> Check it. and sports talk right here. WorldStarHitRadio.com.